are you so happy? My hair so nappy, had an afro. What's good, Gooners? Happy day to everybody. Arsenal versus Aston Villa today is a lot to talk about. I'm really early. I've just pulled up here and it's, uh, it's not even three o'clock yet. So the game kicks off at 4.30. So go down to the store and you know, try and get a some, little bit of something to eat. But let's talk about the game. Now, you've got to sort of ask the question, all of these Spanish managers, man, just coming out of nowhere. You've got Xavi, obviously Unai Emery, Pep Guardiola, um, Xavi Alonso, Mikel Arteta. We're entering a, 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 an age of excellence in terms of Spanish managers. And this all comes off the back of, you know, 20, 20-odd 20 years ago where Spain was, you know, world champions. Euros, they won the Euros, you know, the quick passing, short play. No, this wasn't a physical game. This was a, a game that showed the tactic excellence and skill-based. You know, this is how Arsene Wenger built his team on when he had Riziki, Kleb, Nasri, Fabregas. It was that type of style where the physicality of the game was completely out of it and it was all skill-based. Uh, One-touch football, quick movement, firing the ball passed into the final third uh, with excellence. And, and it was that kind of phase of game that kind of spawned where we are now, so 20 years on. And a lot of these players that were playing in those eras are now managers. And isn't it funny now that like these Spanish managers are just dominating the scene? But this brings me on to Unai Emery. Unai Emery's time at Arsenal wasn't a favourable one. He says he was treated unfairly. He didn't have a lot of control. We know what happened with the head coach tag. Head coach tag, so you weren't even a manager. Very demeaning, and I'm glad they got rid of that in Mikel Arteta's first six months, Tain, when he won the FA Cup. Managing a team and being a head coach are two different philosophies. And there's very rarely anybody in the Premier League that is tagged as a head coach these days. Because if you're asked right to do just one thing, what about all the other aspects of the game? If, you, if you're not allowed to oversee what's going on and make those decisions yourself, how are you able to get everything right? And this was the case with Mikel Arteta. When he came in, he said, first of all, what you were doing having too many sort of chefs in the kitchen with Raul Sinelli and everybody else running around the place, it, was just, it just didn't work. And the idea behind it was really pointed out and pushed by Ivan Gazidis. He's the guy that thought Wenger had too much power. We need to make a lot of people more accountable for their roles. But then in the way they did it was just, just didn't work. So when Edu took in charge of the technical director, his job was more simplified in terms of where everybody was in control and how that power would develop and envelope between everybody else. So take, for instance, uh, Tim Lewis, uh, Richard Garlick, are involved in a lot of the things that Edu's doing in terms of salaries, transfers, and things like that. It's not just down to one person. In this, it's an accumulation of different ideas, um, coming together, and then there's a consensus. So if Edu does make a decision, Mikel's got to be happy with it, T Tim Miller's got to be happy with it, Richard Garlock. So they all kind of work together, and it's the synergy and symbiosis that you have in the club that is working, and is producing the results. And it all stems from Josh Kroenke. You know, 2018, when he was brought in in January to sort of oversee what was going on, it's like... Everything's going crazy here at Arsenal. Stan said to his son, look, I'm too busy with all the sports management stuff I'm dealing with. Arsenal's now yours. I want you to go and spend six months to see what's going on. Report back to me and then we'll make changes. And that's exactly what Josh did. Josh came over to London, sat for six months, watched everything, made notes, went back to his dad. And when he came back, Josh was like, OK, this ain't working. That's not working. This has got to go. You've got to go. Scouting networks have got to go. Raul Sinelli's got to go. Um, Vinay, we need you in this position, not that position. And then we need another guy in there who can properly negotiate. So Dick Law was let go and Richard Garlock brought in. So it was this whole thing that all spawns from Josh Kroenke. So without going too much away from the tangent of everything, this is the development of where we are now. 
And my point is, is that Unai Emery never got this. He didn't get this chance. And so he feels that he's got a thing to prove. And I've always said he's second tier because he's never won. He's never done what Klopp did when he was in Germany by beating the best Bayern Munich side for a title twice. You know, he hadn't done what Pep done. He, he hadn't done what quite a few managers like Tuchel and all of them guys have done. And so when he went to PSG, he went there to win the Champions League. And he'd done the trouble, but that wasn't what they was asking him to do because that team would have, was good enough and, and, quite frankly, the most expensive team put together. Um, and that would have won the titles domestically without a manager. We all know Mbappe was managing that team at the time. So Unai Emery failed to win the Champions League. And then this whole thing, he had to then hit the reset button and start again. Went back to Villarreal, knocked Arsenal out. Manchester United, he won the, the Europa League with that, and now he's getting his second chance. So this is sort of now you can see what his 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 real um, established management skills are like because it's in the best league in, in Europe, the Premier League, against the best teams, and he's really starting to show what he can do. And right now they're in a battle with Tottenham. We know Tottenham lost uh, yesterday four 0 They got blasted again. What is going on with that high line Ang? I mean. He, didn't he work it out after getting beat up by Chelsea 4-1 that the high line doesn't work in the way he plays? He doesn't have the centre-backs. You don't have Gabriel or Salibra to play like that. But yet he's still trying to do it. And time and time, and they were just getting exposed by Isak. How good was Isak yesterday? I mean, yes. Would you prefer him than anyone else? Mind you, me and the Ole Miss has been saying Isak for Arsenal for two years we were saying that so I don't really want to hear no noise about it but the thing about Unai Emery is he's now starting to show his his level and what his level what I'm expecting him to do in order for me to rate him is what Eddie Howe did last year Eddie Howe got Newcastle into the top four um, the budget wasn't massive because Newcastle with the new ownership had to go through that three year um, issue deal and now they're struggling for money <coughs> And now they're struggling for money. Newcastle Newcastle nearly at a point where they have to sell players in order to meet those needs of the agreements and um, FFP. But quite frankly, they're not earning enough. And that's what it comes down to. So for Newcastle, they'll have to go out and commercially reinvent themselves with new sponsorship, probably have to put their uh, ticket prices up, which you know they don't like doing up there up north. But the fact of the matter is... If they don't make those changes, then you ain't going to get back to the top four again. And these are the richest owners in the, in the world. They're 10 times richer than Man City. So I think for Unai Emery, he's going to want to be the one to stop Arsenal from winning this, this, this Premier League title. That's what they're going to come in here with. Unfortunately, they are missing a defender and they're missing Douglas Louise. So I don't really know. I'm going for Arsenal 2-0 win today. Um, but for the Ollie Watkins thing, that's going to be something that you're going to have to deal with. Now, how Unai Emery has managed that is, he's basically told Ollie Watkins, I don't want you to move or run anywhere outside of the 18-yard box. The 18-yard box is the only place I want to see you. And this is contingent on the fact that we have some strikers who, we can talk about Jesus, um, who are just multi-layered in terms of where they play and how they can help the midfield and we saw signs when Kai Havertz last week I mentioned this on the stream where he was actually defending at left back at some point when Arteta lined up in a 5-3-2 uh, formation um, Saka as well um, dropping back Ben White came in to the, to the centre back so we're playing with three centre backs and you almost saw Saka playing as a right back that's how deep we were in those tactics against the Manchester City 0-0 draw at uh, Etihad Stadium. So, a, a lot of things in terms of what he's done with his team at Villa is because he's trying to, to, to give everybody a, a, a role where they're simplified. And that's what's happened with Ole Watkins. 25 goals in all competitions this season. You cannot argue with the results. And that's what happens when a striker is told to be a striker and not a forward. If you're a forward player, I would expect you to press. I would expect you to um, come back and drop back into those box and those empty spaces, pick up the ball and try and hold up play, create triangles and help support your wingers. 
But when you're a striker, I want you to stay inside that box, around that penalty area, so that you can receive the ball with your back to the ball, turn and shoot. Or when a cross comes in, I want you inside the six yards, six yard line to knock it in. And that's the difference between, say, um, what Nketiah is good at. A guy like Nketiah is a fox in a box. That's his role. That's what he's good at. Although he can uh, impress and come back and win the ball in the midfield, he's not as good as Kai Havertz doing it. Kai Havertz can play all over the field in various different dimensions, defending, holding up play, in a double pivot. He can do everything. Yeah. So th this is where... Ollie Watkins has been given one type of information from Unai Emery to say, you are a striker, this is where you're staying, and this is all you're going to be doing. And the results, you can't argue with it. Now, how he gets on today with Saliba and Gabriel is going to be something which many strikers have suffered with. Imagine, we're in the middle of April and Arsenal have let in four goals in, the, in this year, like 2024. Four months. That's, that's, that's a goal a month. You're giving up one goal in the Premier League per month. That's how good Arsenal's defence have been. So I, I don't see much luck today from Villa, if I'm honest. And yes, that is probably good news for Spurs fans. But Arsenal have got their own thing to run now. You win today and there's just six games left. And we've got them two big ones, uh, Old Trafford. And they don't even know what they're calling the, the Spurs stadium now these days. But um, toilet bowl is fine. I'll deal with toilet bowl. So, yeah, we've only got those games to go. And then it starts to squeeze a little bit more. And everyone's getting excited because City, since since we drawed City, they scored two games um, where they had four goals and then they got five goals yesterday. So since we drawed them, they've scored 13 goals in the last three games. And um, Arsenal still have a, a six plus six goal difference against them. So today you win 2-0 and that goal difference starts to go up a little bit. And this is the challenge that Man City have is that you don't have the points right now to beat Arsenal in a title race and you don't have the goal difference so they're really battling against it which brings me on to Liverpool Liverpool man a lot of people are saying Arsenal's going to be the team to choke because we don't have the experience so they've been sitting and waiting for Arsenal to capitulate and by all accounts it seems to me the team that's capitulating is Liverpool and, and for weeks I've been saying these guys are not looking convincing. They're having to win games in the 85th minute and in injury time. And when you're doing that, hanging on a string, to, to challenge for a title is just going to be too much. Because quite frankly, you're, especially your defence, you're not good enough. You're letting in too many goals. You're leaking goals. The Liverpool, I think it was something like four out of their last six games, they've gone down, they've gone down by a goal. They've gone a goal down. You can't start games where you're going down by a goal and having to work that way to come through and fight and fight and fight. It's great, don't get me wrong, because they've been able to do it on top of their injuries. They've been able to kind of facilitate all of those disaster areas and still was top of the league. But it wasn't sustainable. The, the style of football is good, although it's still not as good as Arsenal. And, and the defence by nowhere is, is as good as City or Arsenal's. So it just wasn't sustainable for me. I'm not expecting much changes um, in the same way that the Champions League game is coming up. Um, so maybe Trossard might start today. Uh, I'm not sure whether Nketiah would get a look in. Jesus or Havertz, who's going to start today? It's going to be a tough one to, to think about what they're going to do, especially in the midfield as well. You know, will Party start today? I, I think Party starts today. And I think you're going to have to give some rest to uh, Jorginho or Declan Rice. Maybe Jorginho, because Jorginho playing those two games last week, I thought was that was strange. That was very strange. I, I expected Party to start against Bayern Munich, and, and that kind of threw me sideways. Okay, guys, I'll speak to you later when we get an update. Peace out, guys. All right, what's going on, guys? Team Sheet News. Uh, looks like um, there's been some changes. We did expect some changes to happen. And as I said, they're looking forward to the Champions League game midweek. I did expect Jesus and Trossard to come in today. But it looks like what he's done is he's taken out Kivio on the left back and there's no Tomiyasu there. So it's Shinchenko. But I believe because there's no Douglas Luiz, then that nullifies the threat that Villa have in some ways with the supply they have to Oli Watkins. So we expect to see a lot of Zinchenko in the midfield 
working his way in terms of transition to cover for that double pivot. So your back four pretty much speaks for itself. Raya, Ben White, Saliba and Gabriel. But I mean, I'm still going for 2-0 today. I just don't see without them having Douglas Luiz what threat that they're going to pose. And yes, that does mean Oli Watkins is going to be kind of left out on an island with that lack of support. But then no strikers really had any luck against this, this, this you know, this defence that Arsenal have this season. And so coming in here, suffering suspensions and injuries the way Villa has, and they've not been at the top of their game. They're leaking goals this season. And so you don't really see them getting anything here today. So I'm staying with Arsenal 2-0 today. I'll get to with you guys in our half time. We'll, we'll have a chat about the game, look at the analysis and see what happens there. But I believe you're going to see plenty of inverted Zinchenko today. When he came on against Bayern Munich, he looked fantastic in that second half. And I think today we're going to see him try and control the tempo of the game very early on and then Arsenal on the front foot. Look forward to a quick start today. Speak to you guys at half time. <laughs> Liverpool have just lost to Palace here. It is absolutely crazy. It went to 97 minutes. And Liverpool normally, normally come out with something out of these games, but now they couldn't do anything and they've lost. So it's unbelievable the result now. I mean, if we win today, Liverpool are more probably out of the title race. Not just that, but then they're behind City and they're not going to catch up to City at this stage. So now it's up to Arsenal to pull it out of the bag. Fans are going crazy here at the moment, guys. It's just been insane. So <laughs> I'm going to get to my seat. I'll talk to you guys at half time. So guys, it's uh, it's nil nil, uh, and there's a lot to unpack here. So the first thing for me is um, you, you're looking at the change of uh, tactics and what Arsenal are doing now, having Habarts. It's actually Habarts that's pulled back, playing the number eight role. Trossard's on the left, and Jesus through the middle. Now look, we've been down this road before, and it doesn't work. Although I have to say that the build-up play and the quality of the passes going into the back line have probably been some of the best that Arsenal have played this season. The issue is, is twofold. Number one is Jesus doesn't work as a number nine. And, and we've known that, it's been two seasons and we've known that for a while. So that's the first issue. When balls have been played through on the back line, it's just not there in the build up where you want him to be. And that, and that, that sort of pocket hole seems to be missing. Havertz on the other hand, who is playing an advanced day, has looked fantastic. He's made three or four run-ins and got into space. His movement has been superb in this game. And a few times, he just doesn't have the pace to kind of go away from defenders. But he is picking those holes. And he's making so much things happen because of that. It's causing Villa all kinds of problems. The second issue is, and this is the biggest issue, you've always looked at that double pivot with Declan Rice and Jorginho to control that midfield. But Arteta's gone back to the inverted Zinchenko because he played really well against Bayer. But he's gone back to that route which we played beforehand and thus comes the problems with it. Now, I'm not saying that you need to get Jorginho on the field because I think Zinchenko is still playing really well. The balls coming in from him and Odegaard have been exceptional. But the problem is at that number nine spot where you want your striker to be able to get on the end of things. I think if you put Havertz at the number nine, and you drop Jesus back, or you put in a Smith Rowe, or even put Trossard at the number eight, then you'll be able to have a lot more, you know, intelligent movement, sharp runs, and a better play in the final third. But look, look, I'm not knocking the fruit balls. The creativity has been exceptional. It's just the finishing and the little touches inside of the box. That's all that we're missing. So I think we're doing our part in that regard. On the other end, Oh, what can I say? Look, Arsenal have had 14 shots, Villa's had six shots, none on target, and the closest they've ever come is, is where Watkins has hit the post, and really they probably should have scored from that. But when we're, we're giving them scraps, and it's a one-trick pony as well. Villa are not excelling in their build-up play. They really aren't. They're really struggling to break Arsenal down um, in terms of Emi Martinez. Martinez, by the way, great save against Trossard late in the, in the first half. But I think that we, we're really setting up well against them and, and by all accounts we're dominating the game. But Villa has had their chances. The only thing is, if they're not using a long ball tactic, then nothing's working for them. The only chance Villa seem to have 
is if they go long against us and hope that there's something that comes out of it. So in that regard, Villa's using very limited tactics against us. And I think that the game is really sectioned well for the second half. Look forward to maybe Jorginho, Party to come on, Smithrow and Martinelli, for those guys to come on and add something in the second half. I'm still going with my 2-0 prediction, but it's so tight. And guys, the pace of the game is just electric. I mean, after 30 minutes, both players on each side who played in the midweek in Europe were just exhausted and knackered. If it wasn't for McGinn going down with a slight injury, that gave Arteta and the rest of the players a bit of time, two minutes for a breather, and, you know, for them to get some kind of second wind back in the latter part of the first half. But the game has been played at an exhilarating pace. Really, really exciting to watch as a fan. I'm exhausted just watching it, but we have to win this game. We cannot lose this opportunity to get back to the top of the table after the, the Liverpool result today. Speak to you guys at full time. Well, guys, it seems um, Villa 2 0 today. It seems like we bottled it. And uh, I questioned the team sheet. I did talk about the fact that we had a winning formula, which was have us up top at the number nine, Jorginho and Declan Rice controlling the midfield. And for some reason today, we've just gone away from that. We've, we've, we've gone back to the same formula, which was before Christmas, where Jesus starts up top and you've got Shinchenko controlling it inverted. And, then, and it didn't work then. And it didn't work today. And, um, and you got the result as it is. And, uh, and that's it. So all power and um, control now to Manchester City. I think this is going to go down as Black Sunday because um, the challenge of the title really is over in one full scoop. But the question is really is you couldn't start Jorginho. He just doesn't have the stamina and the body for it. But then the question is, then why didn't Thomas Party start today? That's the issue that I had. And we've gone back to this system that didn't work before. And now, today, is, it's done exactly the same thing. So the plan that we had initially and the system that worked, we've not done that today and then we've not got a result. So that's it from me, guys. Speak to you later. We made it this far, so I can't complain. Let's take, yeah, yeah, let's take. Trip down memory